Uh, any questions while we're waiting? Um, I've, I'm not going to have office hours next week because I'll be in a conference workshop, but I'll probably schedule a time to have a review session before Perry hands out the test the following Monday. So I'll send out an email about that. Uh, yeah, so Okay, it's nine o'clock. Um, next week, I'm trying to find my calendar. Next week is the Wildlife Society annual meeting. So for wildlife biologists, this is the conference, the, the national conference that most people attend uh, and present their research at. There are usually about 1,500 people that that go to this meeting each year. Last year it was in Reno, actually. This year it was scheduled to be in Louisville, but uh, it's canceled. So it's all online. Um, we have four talks, four either presentations or posters from UNR uh, that are being given. Julie's given one, I'm giving one. Uh, and then two other students in my lab are given one. Uh, and we can, if you're interested in seeing those, we had to pre-record them and we have those files available. So if, you, if you'd like to see kind of what people are talking about or what at least we're talking about at UNR at, in wildlife and trying to advance science and wildlife biology, uh, send me an email and, and maybe we can post those online on the website or something. Uh, so Julie will be at a workshop during that on movement modeling. That's what that is, right, Julie? Yep. Uh, during that talk, I have to check and see exactly what time I have to present uh, and make sure there's no conflicts with class. If there is a conflict, I'll just, conflict, I'll just pre-record the video and then you can watch it at your leisure. I have posted another set of practice problems that deal with multiple linear regression and model selection and getting a better feel for AIC and calculating AIC weights. Uh, so if you if you feel like you want extra practice, those are available there and we can discuss solutions during office hours for those. Um, okay, so today we're talking about... Uh, There's also a question, question in the chat about the Lab 5 recording. Lab, okay, yeah, so Lab 5, there actually isn't going to be a recording. It's just going to be um, a PDF, and there's going to be problems that you work through. Uh, so there isn't any formal material, but there is uh, kind of written material that you can review in Lab. So I won't have anything to say at the beginning of Lab, so that's why there's no recording. Uh, and I'll post that right after class or during office hours. Will you give us our partners during the lab for that one as well? I can, I'll post partners when I post the, uh, I'll post it on the first page maybe. And that deals with uh, Poisson regression. You still got that eye on? Yes. Okay. Any other questions before we start? Sorry, so did you say since you're just posting the lab, then we, do we have to come on Wednesday to the Zoom meeting? You mean t today? Still? Yeah, yeah, sorry, today. Yeah, come to lab. Okay. Lab is important. Okay. 
Poisson regression. I have my Apple Pencil fixed now, so I have Whiteboard available again. All right, so Poisson regression is actually, now that we've talked about uh, normal regression and binomial Bernoulli regression, Poisson regression is actually a fairly straightforward extension. And we use Poisson regression when we have count data. We've used a, quite a few count examples already in this lecture. So after this lecture, uh, the learning outcomes are, you, you'll need to be able to know how to write a general and fitted model statement for Poisson regression, just as we did for simple multiple linear regression and Bernoulli regression. Know how to implement Poisson regression in R. Know how to interpret, interpret beta zero and beta one in Poisson regression and know how to use summary table and calculate the expected value or mu using exponential function when covariate values are specified. So same ideas as what we've done for Bernoulli regression with slight modifications. Okay, so here is Poisson regression. The first two lines are the most two important. We have our data, yi, our counts. So we've used quite a few count examples where we should, we probably should have used Poisson regression, but we used normal regression in class because we hadn't gotten to Poisson regression yet. So when we looked, talked about hens of sparrows and, and counts of birds in grasslands, a more appropriate model for that would be Poisson regression. Why is Poisson better? Well, Poisson deals with just count data. When we use normal regression to deal with count data, we can run into problems. And one of those would be negative counts. So in, in real life, we can't get a negative count. However, if we use the normal regression model, it allows for negative counts and that can introduce problems. For example, if we're trying to estimate a confidence interval around a parameter or an estimate, what does it mean if we use normal regression and then we get a confidence interval that extends into the negative range? What does that mean to have a 95% confidence interval that goes negative when we know that counts can actually be negative? So Poisson regression deals with all of, all of those issues because it only allows positive data or non-negative data, meaning positive being one, um, one, two, three, four, non-negative being zero, one, two, three, four, so including zero. When we were talking about Bernoulli regression, uh, we had the logit of mu i equals this, this linear combination. Now we've seen this in all of our models. This is the linear regression in simple linear regression, normal linear regression, and generalized linear regression. We have this linear combination of our parameters beta, and our covariates x. We saw this in normal re regression, Bernoulli regression, and now Poisson regression. The difference is the link function that we're going to use. We use the logit in Bernoulli regression. We're using the log in Poisson regression. The Poisson distribution is really unique compared to all other distributions in that it has one parameter um, when we're talking about the y's. It has this one value here, mu i, that equals both the mean and the variance. So this, this parameter, mu i, is both the mean of the y's and the variance of the y's. In normal regression, we had a parameter for the mean mu, and we also had a parameter uh, for the variance, sigma squared. In Bernoulli regression, we had our probability of success, mu, and then the variance for our data y was mu times one minus mu. But with Poisson regression, both the mean and the variance are mu. So what does that mean in terms of the data we observe? It means that when the mean is small, the variance is also small. So when mu equals one, the variance, the mean equal, the mean of the y's equal one, meaning we're mainly going to see ones, maybe some zeros and maybe some twos. But also the spread around how spread out these data are is going to be very small. It's going to be described by one. 
But if the variance is a thousand, or if mu equals a thousand, on average, we're going to see data that are around a thousand. They may range from like a, a, a 1,500 to 500. Let, let me say that again. They're going to be centered at a thousand, but they're going to spread around a thousand with a variance of 1,000. So when you look at the data, what you see is a fan shape as the as the mean value mu increases, the spread of that data increases as like a fan shape. So the higher your mean, the more variable your counts are going to be, and that's unique to the Poisson distribution. Okay, and that's what this says here. It says the variance of mu equals mu, or the variance of y equals mu. So just in terms of the log, we talked about logit in the last two lectures in the in the lab in lab four. Now our link function is the log function. And actually, this is easier than the logit function. We know if the log of mu equals this combination of beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x one and so on, that we can get mu by itself by just taking the exponent of both sides of this equation. So we take the exponent of this side and the exponent of this side just using algebra, and that'll give the exponent of the log, and those will cancel out, and we get just mu by itself, and we have that equals the exponent of this linear combination. So let's look at an example. Before I go into example, let me just make it a comparison between Poisson regression and Bernoulli regression. When we tried to calculate the expected value mu in Bernoulli regression, we had to do the exponent of this divided by one plus the exponent of this. So this is actually simpler. It's just the exponent of this for count data. And what does an exponent do to values? It makes them all positive. So even if this results, if this this equation here results in a negative value, uh, the inside of this beta zero plus beta one x plus beta two times x two plus beta three times x two and so on to beta d times x d, even if this results in a negative value, when we take the exponent of that, it has to be positive. It turns it into a positive number, and the reason we need that is because this value mu has to be positive because our counts are positive. If we try and put a negative value in a, in a Poisson, it's going to give us an error when we go to R. So the exponent's a nice function to turn values between negative infinity and infinity to values between zero and infinity. So let's look at an example on how we might apply this. This is... Um, these are aerial transects flown by pilots in Glacier Bay, Alaska. So Glacier Bay is a national park in southeast Alaska. Uh, it's part of one of the largest national marine reserve programs in the northern hemisphere. There's actually bigger national marine reserve programs in the southern hemisphere around Antarctica. But it's one of the largest national marine reserve programs in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and these are uh, these green line the black lines represent glacier bay so you can go to glacier bay to look at humpback whales and sea otters and stellar sea lions and uh and uh what is that and harbor seals lots of marine mammals there and killer whales too and in about 1988 sea otters weren't there um they weren't there before 1988 actually sea otters let me see i don't think i have much detail on sea otters in this slide, but they were extirpated in the, uh, 19th, in the 19th century for fur. They have the most dense fur of any mammals in the world, like 100 or a, a million uh, hairs per square inch. So their furs were very valuable and they were, they were uh, trapped and harvested for trade, mainly with China for, for porcelain products in the 19th century. And the, and the population nearly went extinct and because of this over harvest but around uh 1911 19, 1911 and the 1960s there was some new legislation 
that gave protection to sea otters, mainly the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the fur and the fur fur seal treaty. So it gave protection to sea otters among other marine mammals, and they started to recover. So they were absent from Glacier Bay from about 19, uh, before 1988 due to overharvest. It's actually, there's a question of whether they were ever there before then, uh, because there's no fossil evidence of sea otters in Glacier Bay before 1988. But anyway, um, they first, there's first documentation of, of showing up at the mouth of the bay in 1988 down here. And since then, they've expanded throughout the bay and they've grown exponentially. Uh, so one of the few populations that you actually, we've, we've observed grow exponentially. Um, one of the few apex predators we've, we've, we've seen grow exponentially. And so in 1988, they wanted to start surveying how many otters. They want to figure out how many otters were in Glacier Bay. So they developed these aerial transects and they flew along these green lines and aircraft and they counted sea otter groups and where they were. And when there weren't sea otters, they, they counted zeros or they marked zeros. So they fly along these transects in an aircraft and they say groups of sea otters like this. They do their best to count these. They also take pictures and try and count them later. Uh, they do some additional things like fly around groups for five circles and they get two observers trying to get accurate counts. This, these are one of the bigger groups of sea otters. So this would be a hard group to count actually, but oftentimes they're much smaller and they're much easier to count. Here's a big group sea otters flowing in Glacier Bay, they get these counts. So counts are, are very common in ecology when we're trying to estimate abundance. Not only counts of a single species, but counts of multiple species, like the species richness data. This would be another good example for Poisson regression. Um, when you're out doing point surveys and you wanna count how many species are, th are there. So these are the type of data that we use Poisson regression for to, to estimate what's going on with populations. So here's uh, a bunch of sea otters floating. We get accounts of those data. And then our data looks something like this. We have location ID, this is our eyes. Uh, our response data, Ys are our counts. And then we can collect lots of covariates associated with specific locations of those data. Uh, we also probably collect some uh, latitude and longitude data to tr try and figure out, uh, to try and pinpoint exactly where these counts occurred because that could be useful information. Now, things like depth, we can usually get from a GIS. So we have bathymetry layers of Glacier Bay and we can identify where the location was, where the counts were, and then just extract this information from GIS. We can also get other information like um, how far it is away from the nearest shoreline, uh, the slope of the ocean floor, uh, how complex the shoreline is near, and we can get all these information from a GIS. So anyway, we have count data which we're really interested in. And then we have covariate data, like, like always, like we've always used for our regression model so far. And because we have counts, this data suggests using a Poisson model. So if we're interested in examining um, the types of habitat sea otters use, specifically what depths they prefer, we might develop a Poisson regression model. And we might say our data YI come from a Poisson distribution with uh, expected value mu i. Sometimes I'll refer to this as an intensity. Uh, when we use Poisson values, we often describe mu as an, uh, an intensity. Uh, but but expected, it's the same thing as an expected value or the mean of the y's. And then we say y equals the exponent of our intercept beta zero, which we need to estimate plus beta one are another parameter we need to estimate times x and x would be the depth of the area. So we wanna, the overall objective here is to try and describe the relationship between uh, the counts of sea otters and the depth that they're, that they're swimming in. So what habitats they prefer. Depth is really important because sea otters spend most of their time looking for shellfish on the ocean floor. And the depth describes both uh, preferred habitat of shellfish, but also how deep sea otters can actually dive to, to get their shellfish. So while they've been recorded at diving at 100 meters, uh, they actually prefer to dive in much shallower areas. So we might try and figure out how depth describes good sea otter habitat using these data. 
All right, so in Poisson regression, how do we estimate the parameters? There are two parameters in this model here, are beta zero and beta one. That's what we don't know. And that's what's describing the relationship between depth and the counts. Again, we don't have sigma squared in this model like we did in uh, normal regression because the variance isn't described by its own parameter. The variance is going to be described by mu, which equals beta zero plus beta one x or the log of mu equals beta zero plus beta one x. We're going to do very familiar things to what we've already done. We're going to use the GLM function in R. We can enter our data, our counts of sea otters, the depths at which place those, uh, where those counts took place, and then we do GLM y tilde x, and instead of saying family equals binomial like we did with Bernoulli regression, we say family equals Poisson. Describing the link here is optional. We can also just do this. The only reason we, this, it gives us a default link. The default link for the, for the Poisson distribution is the log. And so we don't actually need to put that in here unless we're using something other than a log link. So this is it. This is how we fit this in R. GLM y tilde x family equals Poisson. When we do that, we're going to get two parameter estimates, beta 0 and beta 1, that we can then plug into our model here, and that's going to describe the relationship between x and y. Okay, so if we, after we fit these, we can go into R. Let's see, I have, I have time. So I will pull up R, share my screen. Real quick before you do that, what's the difference between the two lines where the one has link and log and the other one just has family equals Poisson? Yeah, so both work exact, both are going to work exactly the same. Um, the first one is describing a little more detail than we need. The default link function for when you describe Poisson as log. So R, R knows that. We could tell it at that, but it's like, yeah, I already know that. Uh, so we don't really need to put that in. And the oh, only reason, you. yeah, the only reason we would need to put it in would be uh, if we were going to change what the link function was. So we could use other things besides the log link. All right, so let me... Um, create a new R script. I'm just going to copy and paste these commands from this slide here to run this in R. Put in our count data. This is just a subset of the count data. This vector would actually be much longer if we had all of the data from those uh, transects that were flown. X are the depths of each of these points. And we can run our function here. We can look at the results and I'll show you that the results are exactly the same from the first and second one. So we see 4.8715, negative 0 0.2375 for our estimates, and we get the same results here. So let's just, let's just delete this first one. We'll call this model one, and we'll look at the summary of model one. And we get a table that looks very familiar to what we've already seen uh, throughout this entire class. It gives us our coefficients, our estimates of beta zero and beta one, the standard error of these coefficients, so how much spread there is around these coefficients for our uncertainty, and then some v, z values and, and p values, which we haven't really discussed. Okay, so these are the estimates we're looking for. The uncertainty here also tells us a lot about uh, these estimates, and that's important. Uh, just to say something about the uncertainty again, remember if we multiply two times our standard error, especially for our x coefficient, and then add it, add that value to this value, 
and also multiply this by two and subtract it from this value, uh, that's going to give us roughly the 95% confidence interval around our estimate. And if that estimate overlaps zero, then it's saying more or less that this value, this effect size, this parameter could be zero and therefore not that important. However, if we see, when we see we multiply this by two, it's approximately 0.122. And if we add and subtract that from this value, it's not going to cover zero. There's more practice problems on this in, in the second group of practice problems I posted. And if this doesn't overlap, and that, and that doesn't, when we add and subtract two times this to this, it doesn't overlap zero, so depth is probably an important predictor. And, we, and that's verified in, in these results here that we have asterisks here. All right, there's the results. Now let's look at interpreting those results. So we can take our model statement for Poisson regression here, and then we can plug in the fitted values for our intercept and our slope. And then we have our fitted model statement, and then we can work with this interpreting the data. All right, so let's go through interpreting this model. Uh, recall from linear regression, beta zero is the expected value of y, that is mu i, that equals 4.8715 when x equals zero. So if we were using a, a, a linear regression model, this is how we would interpret it. We're not using a linear regression model, we're using a Poisson regression model. I just wanna highlight the comparison between the interpretation of the two models. Uh, and then in the linear regression model, beta one is, is uh, described as for each unit change in X, the expected value of Y decreases by 0.2375. So let's compare that to Poisson regression. So here's what we just talked about in linear regression model. Now, if this were, if we were using a Poisson regression model instead of a linear regression model, beta one is, inter beta zero is interpreted as the log of mu i equals 4.8715 when x equals zero. In terms of our specific application, when the depth equals zero, the log of the expected value of y or the log of mu i equals 4.8715. In terms of beta one, for each unit change in Xi, that is for each increase in meters depth in Xi, the log of mu I decreases by 0 0.2375. So it's saying as we're getting deeper, the log of the expected, the log of mu I is, is decreasing, which means we're gonna have fewer otters. All right, so how do we interpret that in terms of not the log of mu i, but actually something that's related to sea otters. So let's look at, I'm gonna share my entire screen now. Let's look at this first one, beta zero. It says the log of mu i equals 4.8715 when x equals zero. How do we get rid of this log here and interpret this just in terms of the expected number of sea otters? Well, to reverse a log operation, we take the exponent. So if the log of mu i equals 4.8715 at depths equal to zero, let's figure out what uh, mu i is. So log mu i, log of mu equals 4.8715. Now, to figure out what mu is, we take the exponent of this. 
111. So when the depth equals zero for these data, now remember this is just a subset of the data. Um, and, and if we were doing a real analysis, we would do this for all of the data and these numbers would change slightly. But just for this small subset of data, the interpretation doesn't change no matter how many data points we have. When depth equals zero, so very shallow water, the expected number of sea otters are 111.6. Now it's okay that we have a fraction in our expected number of sea otters. This mu, so this is what mu equals when x equals zero, 111.6. Now let's look at the interpretation of beta one in terms of number of sea otters instead of just the log expected number of sea otters. So for each unit change in x, the log of the expected number of sea otters decreases by 0.2375. So as we're going to get deeper, the expected number of sea otters is going to get um, smaller. So let's look at the expected number of sea otters at 10 meters in depth. So to do that, we would do 4.715 minus 0.2375 times 10. And that's going to give us our log mu log of mu when the depth equals 10. And like we did before, we just take the exponent of this to get mu by itself. Now we go from 111 sea otters when depth is very shallow to uh, mu equal to 10.38 sea otters at meters of 10. All right. Uh, Okay, now thinking about that, let's have a little discussion about this. Uh, this, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? Um, when the depth is zero, we expect to find 111 sea otters. And when the depth is 10, we expect to find 10 sea otters. Now there's a couple of issues with this. One, we use a very small subset of the data, so we could get some weird results. And that's why we have a lot of uncertainty around our results. But there's another reason why the um, expected number of sea otters would decrease going from zero to 10, uh, not in terms of the biology, but in terms of the math. So why, why might that be? It's related to it, something we've talked about before, mainly in the elk example in time. Okay, all right. Let me describe this a little more. We have one value, one parameter estimate describing the relationship between sea otters and depth. And when we only have one value like that, our, our beta value, this 0.2375, the best we can really do is a straight line, a linear relationship. So if we had a more complex model, we could develop like a curved line that a curved line that allowed us to have um, a high number kind of at the optimal depth and low numbers when it was too shallow and low numbers when it was too deep. But we're fitting just the linear model to the depth, meaning we don't have 
beta one times depth plus beta two times depth squared. We just have beta one times depth in our model. So we have just a straight line. And that line can either be positive, equal to zero, or negative. And it turns out that because sea otters prefer uh, depths that's in the five to 30 meter range a lot more than the um, 50 to 100 meter range, or even 50 to 400 meter range, because we have depths up to 400 meters in Glacier Bay, that we're going to have a negative relationship. And that, that negative relationship is going to be optimized when x equals zero. So when we have a simple model, like uh, a straight line between the log of mu and depth, we can only get a one directional one directional relationship in, in depth. If we wanted a more complex model, we would say depth plus depth squared. And that would give us a little more flexibility to draw a parabola relating depth to sea outer intensity or log intensity. Okay, so that's why it's somewhat, our model is somewhat restrictive in our intuition, compared to our intuition in biology. So the best, when we have a straight line model like this, and the relationship's negative, the maximum value of mu is always going to be when x equals zero. And that's going to ca capture a lot of the variability in our data, but not all of it. So we might consider a more complex model. And then we would do model selection to choose which one best predicts our data. All right, let me move on now. Any questions about that? Okay, so how do we calculate the expected value mu when we get our values from beta zero and beta one from our R output, and we wanna know uh, what the expected value or mu is when depth equals 51 meters? Well, we plug in our values from R, and then we plug in the X value uh, that we're interested in. And then we just, we just fit this equation. We, we plug in our values here, we do the exponent uh, when we add this together, add this part inside the parentheses together, including this 4.8, uh, it gives us 1.14. Then we take the exponent of that and it gives us 3.13. And that's the expected number of sea otters at depths of 51 meters. The way we get mu by itself again is we take the exponent of both sides and the exponent is gonna cancel out this log and we're left with an exponent on this side of the equation. And that's what we have here. Okay, so here's another example of Poisson regression, but I also want to introduce something else that's important uh, in this example. And it's how we deal with categorical covariates. So in the sea otter example, we had a continuous covariate depth. It ranged between zero and about 500 meters in Glacier Bay, so about 1,500 feet, a uh, little more than 1,500 feet. Uh, so that is a, a continuous covariate. And, and when we have continuous covariates, uh, we, can, we can say, we can describe the relationship as, as beta zero plus beta one times x. And if we want to make it more complex, we can say beta zero plus beta one times x plus beta two times x squared and so on. We can describe it as a function on, with x on the x value and the function of x on the y value, like we do in calculus. But oftentimes we have covariates that don't lend themselves nicely to fitting into uh, continuous values. And we have to group those values. And this is a lot of what lab five is about too. Uh, there's, some, there's some examples on, on categorical covariates. So we have, uh, with the out data, we treated year as a continuous covariate, where it was a, a point in time and we treated time as continuous. But sometimes year uh, can also be treated as categorical. 
before I get into the data, I'll talk about this a little more. Uh, what if we're, what if we don't really care about a, a trend from one year to the next and describing an overall trend, but we just want to estimate what the average value was for each year. And that way we're breaking each year into a category by itself. Other types of categories include um, uh, a treatment group or a control group. So we've actually already talked about categorical variables when we talked about t-tests, when we had two groups, we had a treatment group and a control group. And our X was a category of what group they were in. Uh, but now we're gonna extend categorical covariates a little more. So this is an example that we've talked about, uh, Henslow sparrows. And biologists go out and they burn, this is in Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge in Southeast Indiana. It's the, one of the largest Henzo sparrow breeding populations in the world. Uh, Henzo sparrows return to Big Oaks every year. Uh, Henzo sparrows return to Big Oaks every year and they breed there and they, and they count there. One of the things that has made Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge so good for Henzo sparrows is it has a history of a lot of wildfire. The wildfire create grassland habitat that is really in this specific region in the world that's really good for Henzo sparrows. So refuge managers there since about 1998 have conducted prescribed burns on all the grasslands and Henzo sparrows to try and keep the habitat good for them. And, and they want to know, the question is, uh, what is kind of the optimal time frame in burning a grassland. Should we burn it every other year? Should we burn it every four years, uh, every three years, and, and so on? So that's the question that the managers are asking. And to address that question, they go out and they burn a grassland, and then they let it be for four years, and they, they count how many sparrows are in that grassland for four years following prescribed fire, and they want to see what that trend is. Uh, they want to see how each year differs, the expected value of hens and sparrows each year after a prescribed fire. So they're not going to treat time as continuous in this example, but they're going to break it up into categories where we have category for year one, year two, year three, and year four. The data looks something like this. Here's a subset of the data where we're looking at three of the grasslands that were burned. Um, YSB is year since burn. So how many years it's been since the fire? We see one year after the fire, there's no, there's usually no birds there because all of the, all of the grass has burned and they don't use it. They burn at about the same time they're returning from, or a month before they're returning from their wintering grounds. So there's, it's just a black barren landscape and birds don't usually use it. But then a year, uh, two years after that burn, um, we see the numbers jump up quite a bit. Uh, they continue to jump up in three years, and then by the fourth year, it seems like the numbers on average are, are going down. So here's how we would fit this model if we thought time was continuous, very similar to the elk data. We would do, we would say y uh, equals our counts. These are our y values from here, uh, our counts for, of Henslow sparrows in each grassland. Our x's are the year since burn. These are numbers and they seem to follow a, a continuous trend. And we do GLM Y tilde X family equals Poisson, just as we did with the sea otter example. And then we'll get an intercept beta zero and an estimate for beta one, the relationship between years since burn. And here's what that output looks like. Here's our estimate of our intercept and here's our estimate of our years since burn. And then we have uncertainty in that estimate. Again, we can multiply each of these values by uh, two and add them and subtract them from here to see if they cover zero. Here are what those data look like. Um, the colors represent different grasslands. So all of the red ones are one grassland, all of the black ones are one grassland, and all of the green ones are one grassland. We don't see the red and black and in the first year since burn because they all equaled zero. So, so the red and black one are covered up by this point here. And we see that uh, after one year burn, there's no Henslow sparrows in the grassland. Then they jump up and they continue to climb and then they decrease. So let's estimate the expected value of Henslow sparrows for each year. 
The issue with the way we fit the model here in this example is that it's treating time as continuous here. And the way we wrote our model out, let's see, we didn't write our model out yet, but it's um, our model looks just like, let's see, our model is uh, described right here, where we have counts y come from a Poisson distribution with expected value mu, mu equals the exponent of our intercept beta zero plus beta one times year. And year we plug in here as a uh, one, two, three, or four, and that'll give us an expected value. This is how we write it out in the continuous case when we're treating year as a continuous variable. And we could fit that model for Enzo Sparrows. But what it's going to give us is a straight line through these data. And we can see a straight line is not really going to capture this idea of, uh, of increasing and then subtly decreasing. And we're not going to get, it's, it's going to drag us down. Uh, it'll probably look something like this. It'll go through here. It might go like this even, I'm not sure. But what we want to do is instead of estimating a straight line, Let's fit a, a value for each year and treat them as categories. And the way we do that in R is simple. The way we fit it is simple, but the interpretation is a little complex. So the only difference we do when we fit it is what we're going to do is we're going to say X is a factor. We say factor of X. So X is one, two, three, four. Uh, has contains one, two, three, four. And what it's going to do is break it into four different groups. It's going to be group one, group two, group three, and group four. And these are not going to be numbers, but they're just going to be ways of identifying which group they're in. And the, the one indicates the first group, two indicates the second group, three indicates the third group. So we call it a factor, and then we can fit it just the same as we did before once this is described as a factor. And that's going to give us a very different output than our previous model fit. So let's look at the output again from a previous model fit. When we didn't say x was a factor, we get a slope uh, intercept and a slope value, a beta 0 and a beta 1. Now, when we say it's a factor, this one line changes the entire interpretation of the model. Here's what the output looks like when we say it's a factor. It gives us an intercept. It gives us a beta 1 value, a beta 2 value, and a beta 3 value. And what it's doing is fitting this model here. We're changing our model from just beta 0 plus beta 1 times year and changing what our x's are. When we have four groups, we're going to have three x's. And we're going to have four parameters, beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. So let's look at what these x's are, how it changes our x's. It's going to use a binary language. So for year 1, it's going to create all the x's as 0. For year 2, it's going to say just the first x is 0 and the second two x's are 0. For year 3, it's going to say the first year is 0, or the first x is 0, the last x is 0, and the, and the third x is 1. And then for year 4, it's going to be 0, 0, 1. Now, after we know that what it's doing here, the interpretation of our parameters is exactly the same as we've done before. This is the, the tricky part here, knowing how it's turning that turning that 1, 2, 3, 4 data into these types of data here. So what does this mean when we plug this into our regression model? Well, if we plug in all zeros for x1, 2, and 3, we get beta 1, beta 0 plus beta 1 times 0 plus beta 2 times 0 plus beta 3 times 0. Here's x1, so this is this value. Here's x2, so this is this value. And here's x3, which is this value. And after we plug in those zeros, 
all of this cancels out and all that's left is beta zero. So the interpretation of beta zero is uh, the log of mu equals beta zero when all of our other x's equal zero. And that corresponds with year one. Beta one represents the change in the log of mu for one unit change in x1. So as x1 goes from zero to one, it's the change in log of mu, which is just beta one. So to estimate the log of mu for year one, it's just beta zero, but the log of mu for beta, uh, for year two is gonna be beta zero plus beta one. The log of year, uh, the log of mu for year three is gonna be beta zero plus beta two, because now we have, uh, in year three, we have x two equals one. So beta two stays in here. Beta one gets canceled out, beta three gets canceled out, and we have beta zero plus beta two. And the same thing for year four, where in year four, we have zero, zero, one for our x's. So we have this gets canceled out, this gets canceled out, and we have beta zero plus beta three. So we can think of year one equals beta zero as our kind of reference year. Year two is uh, beta zero plus beta one. So beta one is the difference in the, in the log of u of mu uh, between beta, year two and year one. Okay, so as an exercise, calculate the expected number of birds mu each year uh, each year uh, in years one to four after a prescribed fire. So here is the first year after burn. So I've done the first one for you. Take this uh, home with you today and see if you can calculate the values for all of the years. So for the first year, the log of mu equals beta zero. We found we saw that here where year one it was beta zero. Oh, come on. There we go. Uh, and the log of mu equals negative 18.30 because this is what beta zero equaled. To get mu by itself, we take the exponent of this and the exponent of this is zero. So the expected number of hens or sparrows one year after a fire is zero. And we saw that in our data. Okay, more about categorical and Poisson regression in lab this week. Thanks, and I have office hours now uh, so I can answer any questions.